What's up everyone? Heading over to Homestead, Brooklyn right now. It's a little windy out. I did not uh, prepare for this. I'm from Southern California. I'm just wearing a t-shirt, but I'm excited. I'm almost there. We'll see what happens. Really excited to meet another gardener and let's just see what's going on. Plus, New York City is awesome. <laughs> What's up everyone? Kevin from Epic Gardening here. I'm here in Brooklyn, New York with Summer Rain Oaks. That's right. Which is, a, that name sounds like you, you're like a horse trainer or like a... <laughs> My dad always jokes. Everybody's like, what kind of dad do you have? But he always jokes. He's like, you could have been an environmentalist or a porn star. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, oh, choose the environmentalist route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, they were creative, creative yeah. folks. Th that was the era of the hippie, I think. Right. Right, yeah, I'm Kevin, which is the most popular name I think in the '90s. It's like one of the top three names in the '90s. Yeah, mine was so mine not was, too. Mine was too like spicy. maybe not popular, but it was like in that genre of like weird names that like, I think every celebrity names their kids now. Yeah, a season, a fruit, or like an animal exactly. name or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we are here at her house, her apartment, or. Condo yeah, in, yeah, my home. In, in Brooklyn. It's Homestead, Brooklyn. As you can see, there's quite a few plants here. We're going to take you on a tour. We're going to do a little quick tour. She's going to talk about some of the stuff she's built to house 500 house plants. How many? 500? It's a little bit over that now. A lot over that now. Yeah, six, yeah, seven? yeah, yeah. It, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't it really doesn't matter anymore. No. Because like you, you know, I always tell people I'm like I could cut this today and um and then put it in a thing and that could be a second. Add one so to the tally. Yeah. I just I you know at the end of the day it's it's probably a little over 700 now, but I I haven't done a formal count. I think it's best. It's a lot of plants. not to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we're gonna go through. Each section of the house, she's going to talk about some of the cool stuff she's built, and then maybe one or two of the most awesome plans in the particular area of the house. So yeah. stay tuned. So we are in my kitchen. This is like one of my favorite rooms in the house because it's kind of really quirky space. I do a heck of a lot of cooking in here. Um, I got an old like 1950s sink, some incense burning, and um, just a ton of plants in this area. I kind of do a lot of DIY with my dad because he's retired, a retired truck driver, and he really likes like he's kind of a handy dude. So we ended up doing this like drawbridge garden up here with like an old IKEA shelf that I had with a place that I was consulting for. They were tossing it out, and like a little keychain garden over here that I sometimes will put like little things that I'm kind of like cut and like a propagation station yeah, over a here. Yeah, propagation station, just like using like you know, a keychain holder. Um, yeah, but like, you know, it's, it's people are like, this is not practical. There's a Schefflera growing in your sink, but <laughs> I kind of, you know, I'm not hosting big parties right now. So, um, and I'm about to depart. So I'm, I'm just going to let it kind of grow into the sink for as long as I possibly can. But it, that's really common is when you have to, your plants like outgrow the space and you kind of have to move it. I actually had moved one of the philodendron golden dragons, which is now up on my refrigerator because it was so ginormous, I had to move it. And now this Pachira aquatica variegata and this Schifflera acnonophila nova is taking up where that, um, that golden dragon had left off because they are reaching towards my northeast facing window, which I can't blame them. That's it's great light over. That's here. where they want to go. Yeah, I've actually never seen a variegated version of the Pachira. I love that looks I love insane. It. I really love this variegation. I don't love variegation on everything, but this one I quite like because it has this kind of like little white flecks. It's not it's not more it's not cow like, you know what I mean? How some of right, these yeah. Dalmatian y, but this one is much more refined, I think. It has such an interesting sort of texture yeah. to it. Yeah, it's actually actually quite hearty, so um, I love that one. Uh, yeah, and then I have a little shelf space over here. You're kind of sh maybe shooting into the light, but I, I love my little planter pots and things. So I have um, a lot of cool little planter pots and um, that I think like go well. I, I started collecting a lot of chicken pots because I have um, Kippy in here, and I've kind of grown to like chickens <laughs> <laughs> just a little like, bit just just, just, just enough bit. to live with one exactly yeah. exactly right kippy <laughs> come here yep. do you walk around on the street with her um i do she's usually better at sitting on my shoulder there have you, you become go. just like the woman who walks on i'm the, the street crazy with woman with the chicken on her shoulder yeah. 
but Kippy doesn't mind it. She really likes to be high, so she um, prefers to be up above. And they like to roost high, so she likes to be a little higher than I am because she's a pretty dominant bird. <laughs> So here we are kind of in like the dining room zone. Yeah, this is a dining room zone. This is probably something of interest because this is a vertical swing garden that I built with my dad. Um, it's just really suspended by an old broom handle that used to be in the corner of my house and um, right some rope top there. and some old wood that, you know, nothing really is new here except the, the rope. The rope was the only thing that I actually bought for this one. Right, right. And um, it's held with like some zip ties as well, so. And uh, yeah, and sometimes I'll trade out plants in here. Some of them are kind of like latched on, like this is a Marsdenia floribunda, which is a Hawaiian wedding vine. Mm -hmm. It used to be known as Stephanotis floribunda, but this one um, has just like clambered up and is not going anywhere. So in some cases, those will have to be there forever, but I've changed out like the Syngonium is relatively new, that uh, Philodendron imbe is, is a, a relatively new, but this uh, philodendron Bur Burley Marks fantasy is kind of like doing its own thing up there. So. Yeah, it's, it's like putting on a show yeah. what's happening up there. Yeah. <laughs> this is my living room. It's actually the room with the least amount of light because I don't have a tremendous amount of window space. So I actually grow a lot of plants in here that don't require a tremendous amount of light. So Epiprenum, Oriums, um, all different types of cultivars. This is a Marble Queen. Um, I have another Brazilian pothos over here and some aglionemas. These are all aglionemas, mm. which are, I think, underserved houseplants. They're actually a little bit on the expensive side, but um, for good reason. But uh, I really like aglionemas, and there's so many different kind of cultivars and versions. Some of them are actually species that kind of look pretty cool. You think that they would be a cultivar because of the way that it's variegated. Um, I actually have some more aglionemas over here. Uh, a, a Natal plum, um, one of the philodendrons. Cissus actually grows pretty well. I do have like a grow light here, so this actually helps because these would be more challenging to grow if they were just like stuck in this yeah, little dark corner. They need a little boost. Yeah, and that's actually- That's actually putting out a lot of light over there too. Oh yeah, this is a this is a really good, this is um, an aspect light by Soltec Solutions. They're really good. I have three of those in my house. This is, um, it's like 4,700. So it's like, this is full sun. Yeah. This, if you had it right here, is full sun. That's full sun, yeah. But, you know, light, as you know, kind of dissipates very law. quickly. Yeah. yeah, so this will probably already be medium light down here. This is a Scandapsis, Scandapsis pictus. The way that it's growing, it's actually going to probably touch each end of my apartment. Yeah, it's already in, into the room, the bedroom, yeah. right? It's, yeah, it's, it's trailing it's, all the way over here. I project it's going to be another five years for it to like, because it'll start to grow faster and faster as it gets closer to the light. So this is my bedroom. This actually used to be where my old office was. I ran a startup out of this place, total startup story. There was like no green wall, there were desks here, and I had four or five people coming in every day. It was like, you know, kind of crazy. But one of my goals of this room was always to create a green wall. It was, to my knowledge, the first sub-irrigated plant wall that's ever been installed in a residential unit. So it was a total test. It stood up the test of time in the sense of that I still have it here, but I've done a different kind of sub-irrigation routine. So before I had something that it would measure when the water was below a certain level and then it would refill itself but if those get like gunked up with like dirt it can't read it any longer so after about a year it started to get gunked up so now i actually just turn it on and it just runs its course and then it fills up to a certain level with a subpermeable membrane below it and then it just empties out into each and every one so the first one up top gets filled up first and then the second one, then the third, then the fourth, then the fifth. And that has seemed to work pretty um, good. There are some plants that maybe get too, too much water or in this case, because I only have a light that's up, up above and it's getting some residual southwest facing um, light, these tend to get like, if you go in, you'll start to see some brown leaves or here or there because it just shades it out. Um, right there, they start, they start to sort of kill themselves yeah. a little bit. Yeah, or or the their partner next door. So you just have to be mindful. I sometimes will shift it around, which is pretty cool because at the end of the day, if you want like a different look, like if I just wanted to put all anthuriums in here and have like a whole anthurium fest where it's like beautiful color bracts and everything, I could actually do that because 
they're in they sit in their own pockets and I can move them around and shift them around which is pretty cool um, I would say that's like a different kind of thing and a different benefit than having something that's more permanent you know so to speak so I could just pull this like little pocket out oh, you can see that what so, kind of pot is that it's just a felt like a, felt a, a felted yeah, pocket. Got it. That they sit in. Um, oh, yeah, so you can swap it relatively easily. Yeah, then, huh? exactly, exactly. And, you know, these plants will outgrow. There's some plants that I've had in here since 2012, which is now six years ago. This is the same plant that I've had in here since 2000 six like this this syndapsis and this philodendron are have both been in here since 2006 there's a few others those are the oldest ones this one these are the oldest ones they've been here and they used to be fluffy they're they they were not always long so sometimes i have to decide whether i want to like cut them back and get them to be bushy again i love testing things out in here because this is kind of like one of a kind here so i'm always testing this year i never really had allocations so you notice I have yeah, a lot of allocations this time. Too. This yeah. Like, uh, with Amazonica or Amazonica, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is um, uh, Frydeck. Frydeck is. Like... And then this is uh, Regal Black Regal or something. Like yeah. That it's called. This is uh, Reginula. It's just such Reginula. a like contrasted leaf shape to like yes. what you normally see. Yeah. It's such a nice little pop on the wall. It is. And I actually really love them in, in this wall. Agalunemas do exceptionally well on the wall. I put all my maiden hair ferns up here because Kippy likes to eat them. Uh -huh. Actually, this one's a little broken. I could probably give that one to her. But they, I just got this wide leaf one, which I'm testing out, but the, the smaller leaf ver versions actually do quite well. Wow. And I've actually never seen a wide leaf. Yeah. There, there's so many different types of maiden hair ferns. Yeah. Um, you could get variegated ones. There's also, That's also awesome. I used to just do maiden hair down below, but I've had to move a lot of my plants that Kippy enjoys eating up. <laughs> um, so I've, you know, lessons learned. So this is my biopod. This is like a glorified vivarium. It, you actually control it by your smartphone and it does all its own watering, its humidity, and its lighting. And I love it. I actually have like crammed this probably with like 80 plus species. I don't even know how many more I put in there because every time I get something, I'm just like, I want to put it in my biopod and it grows like crazy. So I have to constantly cut it back. You'll see that I actually cut back a Pelionia repens here because it was just going right up and it was kind of blocking a lot of other plants, but you'll see some really interesting species here. This one with the lightning strikes is a type of jewel orchid. It's called Macoides petala. Um, that pattern is insane. It's really, it's really neat. And you get some really cool patternings in here. Here's like Hoffmania. This is a type of Gesneriad, which I really like the color of. Um, Pelionias, I have a couple different like versions of this one. You can see the leaf patterns are a little different in each of those Pelionias, but mm -hmm. it's the same species. If you go back here, I have um, some really interesting Peperomias. And this is a Philodendron brantianum, and this is a Peperomia. And I, I kind of put them side by side to give people an idea that you have like very similar coloration, but com you know, in a completely different genus. Mm. Mark Garvias that are here that I have like some uh, Raphidophoras in the back as well. There's so much growing in here that like I can't even. There's a universe within this, this there is. little tiny thing. It's a yeah. total microcosm. Some some ficus back here and some, um, you could see some the sphagnums even like coming back to life. This is a ficus velosa, which is like that really fuzzy one back mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So much cool stuff. Like I can't. I, it's just, it's too much. I, I'm actually gonna get a second one because, the problem is when I get a second one. I'm gonna want a third and a fourth. Yeah. Your house will <laughs> but, become. Uh, you should make your entire house a vivarium. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's that's how I talk. To, I talk with a lot of people who get these, and that's what they kind of go into, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, now I have like 20 of them." Um, but you could see the difference of the way that you know these grow when you're giving them kind of more appropriate conditions to what you have in your house, and I think that. I, w I often say that houseplant owners are some of the best gardeners because they work with the least amount of things that the plant needs. Like we're always mm. short on space, short on light, short on humidity. And so you always have to kind of make it work. Whereas like if I stick something in, you know, in my planting box outside, you get like the sun and it's just, the, the plants just grow and you, you know, you might have to water them, you know, here and there, unless you set up like an irrigation system. But with houseplants, you kind of have to tend to them all the time because they're like most 
away from their yeah. like current habitat. You've removed them from where they want to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This one is, they kind of take care of themselves, but the only problem that I have here is that they grow so crazy that I have to, and they're in such a confined space yeah. that I have to always constantly cut it's them It's almost back. too perfect. It's so good for yeah. them. And, and it's a great place that I could like start like little bulbs and plants. There's some really interesting rare varieties in here that probably don't like look like much to the average person, but ones that I'm like proud that I could grow mm -hmm. indoors because they wouldn't <laughs> typically like grow, you know, in my bedroom without this. This is, this used to house all of my clothes in here. <laughs> I got rid of most of them. And I turned this into a closet garden, which initially had edibles in here. And that was actually how I invited so many pestiferous insects into my house is actually by doing a lot of edibles. Um, I had potatoes that I was growing in here that attracted everything, like mealybugs, white flies, spider mm -hmm. mites, everything along those lines. So, how did, wait, how did the potatoes go? Did you get a decent harvest? Uh, they were tiny. Yeah. Because I'm just growing them in small containers yeah. and they're not getting as amazing. I got southwest facing windows, which not on a rainy day is actually really intense light. Mm -hmm. And then I have a couple grow light here, grow lights here, but it's nothing that compared to when you're growing it outdoors. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is good enough for like a lot of foliage varieties. So I started, I mean, some of these things are edible. This is chaya. This is like a Mexican plant, which is typically not a house plant. Um, it is poisonous raw, but if you cook it, it's not poisonous. So it's actually, um, I don't know if it's commonly eaten, but it's <laughs> like, it's eaten in Mexico. It can be eaten, from. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, and there's probably so many other plants that have uses that we really don't know, but a lot of these plants actually have to water them before I leave. Um, some of these are on humidity mats. So basically we just built some shelf space here. You can obviously see that this was a closet at some point because it has like yeah, my hanging pole up there. Yeah. And so now I've just kind of taken, this is my non nooch vine that I, you know, have like wrapped around it, um, as well. So there's just like a lot going on here. It's probably not the prettiest space, but like it's, I love it because I could grow more plants and this was really good light that I basically was wasting by. It's yeah. In a, in a small place too. It's like, if you have a Southwest facing window, you might as well use it. Exactly. That's how I, that's how I felt. I was like, it was such a waste of light. <laughs> right. You know, I ha I'd have to put a curtain here so that my clothes didn't bleach, mm. but you know, it was perfect for, for growing. So this is a corner of my workroom and I get really good Southwest facing light here. So I actually grow a lot of succulents and cacti in this corner. I call this actually cacti corner because <laughs> of that reason. Um, so a lot of these window space, it can't, a lot of foliage varieties can't tolerate that amount of light, especially, I mean, we don't have a lot of light today because it's overcast. This is a little rendition of what I have growing here. And I'm also under my ficus lyrata, which I cut back by about two thirds. Yeah, recently. let's just take a look at this thing for a second. It yeah, is it's absolutely huge. massive. It's like, it's about 14 feet tall. I've had it for nine years. It was obviously older than that when I got it, but um, it's, my special plant and um, it's gone through a lot with the, my construction recently that I've had in this house, but, um, but it's, it's persisted. That was it. I mean, we did a, I'm sure the tour could be a lot longer. 25 hours longer than that. It could be so long. We could go into the depths of the universe with, yes, <laughs> with this but place, this is, but this is just a little perfunctory overview. Yeah. Just a, I guess a teaser trailer. I mean, you have how many videos on your channel about each plant and, and yeah, each section? I, mean, I, think, and... I think now I'm like on my, 80 something episode. Okay. So I do it, I do it weekly every Thursday at 7 a.m. So every Thursday, 7 a.m. It's called plant one on me. Plant one on me. Yeah. Plant one on me. Yeah. So what, so I have a question which I know the answer to for myself, but I think maybe other people wouldn't. And that would be kind of just like the philosophical way, like why so many, like why so many plants? Why well, this has go been, this hard, you know? Well, I mean, I think that for one, my backgrounds as an environmental scientist and entomologist. Yeah. So I just love being out in nature and bringing that indoors for me here in the city, I think allowed me to feel at home. For me, it's like the, this curious aspect of not only does it make me feel good and, you know, create this environment in my home, but I also like testing and trying species that typically you wouldn't maybe find growing indoors. Yeah and kind of pushing the boundaries to see if it potentially could grow indoors. So that for me is quite, quite interesting, you know, and you, you don't always win that battle in that right, sense. Yeah. You know, sometimes these things that 
you test don't necessarily grow well indoors. Sometimes I try a second or third time with that particular species if I really think it's really interesting. But this has been a process of, you know, I've lived here for 13 years. Mm -hmm. I've been growing stuff in my space for at least nine. So it's been, you know, a process of kind of acquisition. And one of the things is there is a lot of plants here, but I always try to fit them in their place. Like they, they somehow feel in their place for me. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Cause I'm not really an aesthetic minded human being i'm like hyper practical probably to a fault like very systematic and i'm into edibles mm -hmm. so it's sort of a different world where i you might argue that that is the more practical gardening method Absolutely, I mean, at least yeah. i can eat the potato right yeah, exactly. versus look at it but but yeah for me I'm, i look around and i'm like it looks normal while being abnormal quote unquote you know what i mean like it yeah. all does fit yeah it fits and actually when my house was under construction i had all of my plants if you could imagine in the center space kind of where we're sitting and in, in so that like the construction workers weren't bumping into them and that became too much for me because everything is in their place and i know how to water everything when it's in their place but when it's not in its place it's like it's overwhelming yeah, yeah. so um so that was something that was like a really interesting realization for me when it's out of place that it just feels like too much but yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say that this is like the most practical thing. Although there is like <laughs> practical aspects of my daily routine. So I, you know, I have a 150 foot wa like watering hose that uh -huh. the filter. This makes it much more practical to water for as sure. opposed to just like spot watering it with a watering can, which I do now and again because some things need a little bit more of a watering can than a spray hose. But you know, the, the sub irrigated wall, you know, waters about 70 plants with a yep. flip of a switch. And then that's, you know, really practical. So a lot of these things, humidity mats really help hydro spikes. A lot of things that I kind of like touch upon. I, episode 16 is like, for me, it was like watering hacks. And a lot mm -hmm. of people ask me like, how do I water my plants? Cause that's yeah. the biggest like bottleneck. That's easily the number one question, especially for indoors. Yeah. Is yeah especially what am indoors. I doing wrong with my water? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that all that kind of stuff like makes sense for me. And then now that I have like an outdoor space to grow my food and stuff like that, I agree with you. Like, I think that kind of stuff is like a little bit more practical, although it's like kind of cool to experiment and kind of push the boundaries outdoors yeah. as well. I, so I guess I kind of go ornamental with my edibles where I'll grow a variety that's not necessarily the most productive mm -hmm. or sometimes even the most flavorful just because I'm like that. I want to see that cross section of that tomato when I cut into it. Oh, that's you know? really cool. Yeah, I, I've, I've definitely grown a lot of like heirlooms tomatoes where it's oh, yeah. like I didn't get a huge harvest, mm -hmm. but they're um, they're really flavorful. This year I decided to do a non heirloom variety um, sugar lumps. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're heirloom and I had so many this year. Yeah, it's like too many almost. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I only have one tomato plant because the, the plot that I have in my community garden is very shaded uh -huh. comparatively. Um, so you have to kind of grow a different kind of There's only so know, much yeah, there's only so much that sunlight that you could spare. Yeah. Yeah, I grew I I grew peanuts this year. Oh, that's fun. Just because I saw them. The way that they kind of grow I, is Yeah, really, like when yeah. you share, because it, it's one of those plants where it's like, you know, it's kind of like a pineapple, right? Yeah. Like most people eat it, mm -hmm. and most people also have no idea that it grows that way. Yeah. Like the pineapple looks like it's out of Dr. Seuss, to yeah. me at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then peanuts cool, yeah. are like a legume that produces a flower that hits the ground yeah. and then goes underground, and yeah. it's like wild, you know? But yeah. the harvest was total trash. Like I got like <laughs> five, I think. But it's I have a video. It's more for the, I think, the yeah. novelty of it. Or yeah, it was the doing process. It, you're doing it was... it with like kids too. Like that's kind of always cool to yeah. see that the way that the peanut grows. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it was hilarious. I did this video where I like pull out my five peanuts and like <laughs> shell them and like roast them in a tiny little thing and yeah. like put a little butter and salt and like <laughs> snacking on the little peanuts. I did that with <laughs> my sweet so potatoes. Ridiculous. I grew some sweet potatoes indoors like a few years ago and they were like the harvest was like very dominal, and, yeah, um, yeah. but it was like fun enough. I, I was able There's to get a pride a in it, it too. Yeah. Like I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, I grew that, yeah. that stupid little peanut. You yeah, know? <laughs> exactly. What do you think about the diff? Because I'm mostly edibles. Like I said, you're you're more on the ornamental side. Mm -hmm. What do you think it is about the people that? gardening will attract because it does seem at least to me that there is a bit of a split I, I know for me like if I share ornamental stuff people aren't as interested because they're more on the edible side right it does seem like there's a like sort of a divide yeah no for sure I think it's by the, the bifurcation comes from where you live mm. oftentimes so so many of my peers 
live in cities and we don't have necessarily have let alone backyards we don't have balconies so you have to kind of bring things indoors but that joy of actually growing still persists mm -hmm. in each and every one of us yeah so the fact that you know i didn't get a community garden until two years ago so up until that point i wanted to grow and expend my energy in that way but i didn't have any way to be able to do it and mm -hmm. i didn't have a balcony i didn't even have right. a fire escape actually until this year so it was the ability to be able to grow outdoors just wasn't available or i could actually volunteer at the community garden which i had done mm -hmm. but um it wasn't about actually growing and cultivating like a space outdoors so for that i think that it's by virtue of kind of where people live i also think that there's a bifurcation like as i started to do the biopod and semi-aquatic and aquatic plants yeah. that is a whole different world um onto itself there's a lot of people who actually grow those types of plants for frogs or shrimp yeah or... i learned a lot about that recently yeah so about... that, that's pretty cool too because then that that's like a whole other world but yeah. there is some crossover you know that you start to see um at the end of the day and i think the real crossover is really that you know f for the love of plants and there's yeah. a lot that you can mm -hmm. learn you know from somebody who grows outdoors versus somebody who grows indoors versus somebody who's growing within kind of a vivarium or a plotarium like uh or terrarium even yeah, yeah so because if you boil it down to at least for me like I'm very science minded and for me it's like the process of growth is just fascinating in all aspects of life but then plants are like a very direct way to see that happen yeah. you know yeah, and sure. especially when you're outdoors you're like if I train it up this way I get better production or if mm -hmm. I prune it this way I get better production it's just you're running experiments all the time indeed which is just fascinating to me you're running experiments as long as you have trained yourself to observe yes in my book the beginning is sort of just like the primer of like here are some basic skills you need and then I close the section out by saying like actually the meta skill above everything mm -hmm. is you have to have your eyes and senses open because mm -hmm. all the practical like this is how a plant works this mm -hmm. is how light affects the plant it actually doesn't matter if you don't see the thing that's happening exactly you know what I mean yeah but but I wanted to give you a chance to kind of just like share what you're up to. You got a lot going on, books, courses, probably many other things. So Yeah, I think people could find me on my website at homesteadbrooklyn.com and you can look up my name, Summerine Oaks or Plant One On Me or Homestead Brooklyn on YouTube as well and Instagram. And um, and yeah, and the things that I'm kind of doing this year is my houseplant masterclass online, mm -hmm. which should launch before the end of the year. Oh, um, really? Nice. Yeah, people could actually pre-support it at a reduced cost through Indiegogo, which okay. is really nice. And then also my book, How to Make a Plant Love You, will be coming out in July, a couple nice. months after yours. Yep. Um, but you could also pre-order it already now. So oh, really? It's nice. re reduced rate. So okay. um, so you could look out for that as well on my, my website and on Homestead cool. Brooklyn. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put all the links, guys, in the video description as always. And thank you. Thanks yeah, for, thank you. Thanks for, for being for cool. By. And yeah, let me stop by. Good luck in the garden, guys. Keep growing, and I will see you on the next one. Yeah. Peace. And Kippy says goodbye. Her booty <laughs> says goodbye. <laughs> Am I in? Yeah, I'm in. Cool. You're in. Cool. Well, guys, oh, there she goes. <laughs> Bye, Kippy. Bye, Kippy. Um, that was it. I just gotta loosen myself up. <laughs> <laughs>